say another thing that's more in the realm of the spirit, I guess. And that is, if we are to go on in the days ahead and make true brotherhood a reality, it is necessary for us to realize more than ever before that the destinies of the Negro and the white man are tied together. Now, there are still a lot of people who don't realize this. The races still don't realize this. But it is a fact now that Negroes and whites are tied together. And we need each other. In a real sense, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. John Donne placed it years ago in graphic terms. No man is an island in private health. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And he goes on toward the end to say, any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And so we all in the same situation. The salvation of the Negro will mean the salvation of the white man and the destruction of the life and of the ongoing progress of the Negro will be the destruction of the ongoing progress of the nation. Well, grace and peace, and welcome to chapel, everyone. Yo, it is so good to be with you all today. Uh, I want to say welcome back to our returning students. Happy New Year. I also want to give a special shout out to any new students, uh, any transfer students, or if you are a new faculty or staff member and you're new to the North Park community, we want to say welcome to you. This is chapel. This is a time where every Wednesday from 1030 to 1130, we worship our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we fellowship and we grow together. Also, I want to say welcome to our, our alums or our friends of North Park, whether you're watching at home, on campus, or somewhere around the world. We are glad that you're here today. For those who don't know me, my name is Pastor Terrence Gadsden. I serve here as a campus co-pastor and athletic chaplain. Um, I'm a part of University Ministries, and University Ministries is located in student engagement. And we are a team of seven that work together to share and show the love of Jesus Christ, not only on our campus community, but also in the city and also throughout the world. So we're glad that you joined us today. You can also follow us on IG or Facebook, or you can go to the North Park webpage and look under University Ministries and see what we're gonna be doing this entire semester. Obviously due to COVID-19, a lot of our services and things we're gonna be doing are gonna be virtual, but that's not gonna stop us from doing what we do. Um, a few announcements before we get started this, this, this day. Um, College Life is gonna be having three traditional services this semester, February 21st, March 21st, and April 18th. They're gonna be right here at Anderson Chapel at 6 p.m. and we're gonna be worshiping. So if you have any questions, you can contact Amber Jip for more information. Also, we're excited to be launching a new College Life Podcast 606. And that is gonna be led again by Amber Jip. And that's gonna be a time for us to engage in conversations and have some real insight information. So you don't wanna miss that. That's gonna be on YouTube and also other uh, platforms where you listen to podcasts and more information will be coming on that pretty soon, all right, amen? Well, this morning, as we celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, we have a special guest who's gonna be bringing the word this morning. And we're honored to have Ms. Jazzy Johnson. Jazzy Johnson is a Texas native and also an adopted Chicagoan. <laughs> She's an educator and an activist who specializes in curating and facilitating um, transformative spaces for learning and listening in the area of social justice. She is a graduate of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And for six years, she led InterVarsity's CUP program, Chicago Urban Project Program. She is currently a Master's of Divinity student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And she is a great speaker and a great friend of ours. And so we're excited today to have Ms. Jazzy Johnson as our, our guest speaker as we celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here at North Park University. So in a few minutes, we'll have Ms. Jazzy Johnson bring us the word. 
But before we do that, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity for us to worship you. And we invite your spirit in this place. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, North Park family, it is great to be back with you. Welcome to chapel. We have endured quite a bit in the year 2020, and we are here together wherever you may be in the year 2021, expecting God to move. Amen. The spirit of God is with us with all that we've endured and with all that's going on around us in our country, around the world. God is still faithful and we need his Holy Spirit to have eyes to see what God is calling us into for such a time as this. So brothers and sisters, I really just want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer on our behalf. God, here we are embarking on a new semester some of us are excited, some of us are weary already. Some of us are skeptical, some of us are angry, some of us are upset, some of us just wanna get through. But God, wherever we find ourselves on this journey, God, your Holy Spirit's promise, you said that you would send the comforter, your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. So God, we acknowledge you this morning as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our comforter, how we need you. Carry, you said, and I will give you rest. So, God, we accept your invitation this morning to lay our burdens at your feet. Your word says, Come.
have the humility this semester to stay a while, not lean to our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge you, trusting that the resurrected power of your spirit will give us rest. Rest that the world didn't give us and the world can't take away. We acknowledge you, God, as sovereign. Rest with us. Abide with us. That's our prayer. Amen. But there comes a time when people get tired. There comes a time when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time that people get tired of being plunged across the abyss of exploitation where they experience the bleakness of nagging despair. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing in the piercing chill of an alpine November. Hello, North Park. I share greetings and desires for peace with you all. It is good to be with you, though we are not currently physically present together and it is an honor to be seen and or heard by you as we gather to honor, to remember, maybe perhaps to celebrate and certainly venerate the life, the work and the being of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As well as some of his comrades in the struggle of the mid to late 20th century who we must remember as well, some of them being Sister Ella Baker, Bayard Rustin, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Yuri Kochiyama, Fannie Lou Hamer, Grace Lee Boggs, Chicago's own Fred Hampton, and many, many more whose names and stories we do not know, but who planted and watered the seeds of the trees that have grown over decades now that provide us companionship and covering. For those of us who have the honor and the task of speaking as a part of any celebrations, for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the last two weeks, we must face the task of not only dialoguing with Dr. King's life, words, and legacy, but we have been asked to respond to the question, what would Dr. King say about the events that transpired at the Capitol barely two weeks ago? What would Dr. King do in the moment as we find ourselves as a country where thousands of people are dying a day from the COVID-19 virus, where state-sanctioned violence continues to run amok against black and brown communities, where the person who has occupied the highest position in the land has incited a violent coup d'etat, which resulted in the takeover of the Capitol building and members of Congress needing to hide as they feared for their lives and ultimately, which resulted in the death of five people, a country where we are still having the cruel debate about whether or not everyday essential workers should be paid a livable wage, regardless of their age, because all labor has dignity, as Dr. King was known for saying. Many are asking, wondering how Dr. King might have responded in this time. And honestly, I think the brother would have been exhausted. So tired, aren't you? exhausted. I know that I am. I'm, I'm exhausted and I'm tired by the collective grief and the trauma we've endured over the last year. Many of us thought 2021 might bring some relief, but so far it has just been as intense and as exhausting, and it's too much. And yet, here we are, still here. How? How are we making it? In Mark chapter 6, we see that the 12 disciples have just been sent out in pairs and they proclaimed that the kingdom of God had come near, calling out people to repent and change their hearts and their lives. They cast out many demons and healed and anointed many who were sick. Chances are they had faced opposition as Jesus had warned them when he sent them out. 
The disciples were putting in work and in the Mark account of feeding the 5,000, it says that they were just returning from all this laboring for the good of the people and the kingdom and they were reporting back to Jesus all they had done and taught. It says, and they were tired. The text says many people were coming and going so there was no time to eat. So they were probably hangry. Jesus said to the, to the disciples, the apostles, come by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. When Jesus arrived and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. Later in the day, his disciples came to him and said, this is an isolated place and it's already late in the day. Send them away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat for themselves. Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. But they said to him, should we go off and buy bread worth almost eight months pay and give them to eat? Jesus said to them, how much bread do you have? Take a look. After checking, they said five loaves of bread and two fish. He directed the disciples to seat all the people in groups as though they were having a banquet on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, broke the loaves into pieces and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate until they were full. They filled 12 baskets with the leftover pieces of bread and fish. About 5,000 had eaten. Jesus saw the crowd and had compassion on them. And though the disciples were tired, Jesus turned their gaze to the crowd. And I'm sure the crowd who had hurried to meet Jesus and the disciples were also tired. But there they found themselves all together. Theologian Dr. Willie James Jennings of Yale Divinity School says that the crowd is everything. The crowd is us, people shouting, screaming, crying, pushing, shoving, calling out to Jesus, Jesus help me, Jesus over here, people being forced to press up against each other to get to Jesus, to hear him and to get to what they need from him. Quite a claustrophobic image, right? People who hate each other, who would prefer not to be next to each other, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, rebels, insurrectionists, murderers, tax collectors, widows, the orphans, the poor, the rich, sex workers, thieves, gangsters, centurions, addicts, city leaders, people from all over the Roman Empire, all pressing up to hear Jesus. Jesus created the condition for the crowd. It is the ground to which all discipleship will return, always aiming at the crowd that is the gathering of hurting and hungry people who need God. That's the end of the Jennings quote. All the people who need healing, who need safety, who need shelter, who need health care, who need someone to believe them, who need to be held, who need to eat at the heart of Dr. King's ministry, lest we forget that he was first a minister, is that time after time after time again, Jesus grabbed a hold of Dr. King and he turned his gaze to the crowd. In Dr. King's early vocational journey as he's discerned taking on a pastorate or working for a university, Jesus turned his gaze toward the crowd as the bus boycott in Montgomery began and the organizers were looking for just the right leader. Though he was 26 years old, Jesus turned King's gaze toward the crowd in the moments of feeling exhausted, of wanting to give up when he was sitting at his kitchen table on a Friday night early in Dr. King's public career in 1956. And he received a phone call that threatened his life and that of his family. He recalls this in his book, Stride Towards Freedom. King says, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward in this state of exhaustion with my courage all but gone. I decided, to make my problem, take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and I prayed aloud the words I spoke to God that midnight. 
are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but right now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my power. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone, King said. I felt this kitchen table moment so many times in 2020 after Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and after George Floyd, time and time again, I found myself falling apart and having to put myself back together out of the assurance from God that I was not alone and could keep going. When Dr. King came to the end of himself, God gave him the assurance that he was not alone. And in that moment, God had compassion on Martin Seeing him as one in the crowd, do you see that? That the crowd is everything. We must see the crowd clamoring and pushing up against one another, starving and crying out. The crowd is us. We are starving. We seek a good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd of Jesus do in this moment, in this passage? He assures us that what we need, we have that we have what we need to eat and to survive together. The disciples wanted to send the crowd away. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. Go and see what we have right here. Take inventory of what our community already has, the resources, the gifts, the skills. Jesus said, bring them to me. I will bless them and multiply them and we will have more than enough. We have what we need together. 2020 revealed many things to us. A major thing it revealed is that no institution, no government, no outside help is coming to save us. Jesus is not outside of us. The Holy Spirit is already within us and our community. When I ask the question of how are we still here, I believe it is because we have begun to embrace that if you don't eat, I don't eat. Ubuntu. That is one of the things I love most about some of our current movement work, especially want to highlight the work of Good Kids Mad City, Black and Brown youth organizers, young folks your age, younger than you, who all throughout 2020 and prior to have organized a mutual aid program in Chicago to make sure folks have groceries and are able to meet basic needs that they have and stay safe during the pandemic. Or the many Chicago organizations like the Let Us Breathe Collective, the Women's Justice Institute, Asada's Daughters, and many other organizations who have for years taken on the crucial and challenging work of abolition, which at its essence is the work of seeing the crowd, collecting the resources of the community, and imagining and building communities where we are all responsible for one another and each other's safety. That is what King did. He saw the crowds before him. He, ass he assessed what bread they had, activating the gifts and resources of those around him. And together, they moved a nation, a world, a nation we're still trying to move on many things, yes. But nevertheless, Dr. King wasn't the Jesus of the crowd, as we often make him. Like the disciples, Jesus challenged Dr. King to see the crowd and feed them. And like the disciples, Dr. King found himself also among the crowd, knowing that we are all tied in a single garment of destiny, himself included. This is Ubuntu. It is a reorientation of our being, not simply our doing. We must deprogram all that has taught us to see and to conceptualize our identities towards self-sufficiency and rugged individualism. You were shaped and formed as a part of creation, not apart from creation, as a part of a community. We belong to each other. We are the crowd. Ubuntu is not being sent away to the countryside to fend for yourself and find something to eat. It is staying with the multitudes because together we have what we need. Together, when we all wear our masks, when we all socially distance, we choose the safety and well-being of the crowd over our own comfort, amen? Ubuntu is the embrace of enough. It is the rejection of the myth of scarcity, which fuels competition and violence, and it is the relinquishing of excess. It is the manifestation of give us today our daily bread. The prayer is not give me today my daily bread, and I know 
that this is hard for those of us who have prayed that prayer and the daily bread has not come. Hear me when I say that I am enraged for you and with you, I grieve with you and I confess that if there have been days that your daily bread has not come, I know that it is linked to me eating too much that day or to me turning my back or sending you away. I confess and repent of that. See, Dr. King's economics were not about seeing the crowd and feeding them thrown away food at, at the local food kitchen. No, what both Jesus and Dr. King called for in the crowd is a redistribution and sharing of resources, a new economy so that all can eat and have what they need. I call your community around you, yes, as college students, to get creative about seeing the crowd around you and seeing yourself in the crowd that Jesus has deep compassion for and together creating new economies of sharing, of mutual care, even while you are socially distant. I learned Ubuntu also as an undergraduate student at Northwestern University. Some days Ubuntu looked like protest and direct action, but many days it looked like cooking for others, inviting them, them into my space, learning their stories and creating spaces of vulnerability while sharing to meet practical needs. Ubuntu is not easy. Ubuntu begs the question of who are you, who are we, and who will we be when it matters most to know who we are? It is a human claim to wholeheartedly live into the truth that I am because we are. So today I'm inviting you to see Dr. King as one who is human, as a man who only was because we are. Gift him the dignity and the love and the respect to free him from his pedestal. Let him be real to us, as real as he was at that kitchen table, as real as he was as he addressed the crowd the day before he was assassinated and he contemplated his mortality, as real as he was when he would play with his children or hold on tightly to his wife or play pool and laugh with the other leaders. I love all these photos of Dr. King living in color that have been circulating on social media. I think we rob our martyrs of the lives they lived when they only live as martyrs in our minds. I feel the same way about Jesus, that we often quote the text that says Jesus wept, but I want to know the other side of Jesus's humanity. I want to know that Jesus laughed and felt joy. That too is Ubuntu. My laughter is tied up in your laughter, so please hear me say that I hope you laugh harder than you cry in the struggle. There is joy in the crowd that reflects the glory of God, I promise you that. Let him be real. Let Dr. King begin to live in color in your imagination so that the life he lived doesn't feel so unattainable. So that we realize that if Dr. King were still with us, he would be just as tired as we are just as exhausted by the bad news that we get every single day in our news feeds and our doorsteps and in our families. And yet we are socially distant and Jesus calls us to see one another in the crowd. We are hungry, we need to be fed. And if you don't eat, I don't eat. How much bread do you have? Take a look, Jesus said. The Biden-Harris administration is not a genie in a bottle. It will not fix everything, though we especially celebrate our sister Vice President Kamala Harris. We mustn't look outside of ourselves. Take a look. What bread do you have in your community, at North Park, in your neighborhood, in Chicago, or wherever you call home? What resources, what ideas, what gifts, what skills, what wild imagination and freedom dreams? Take a look. Let us bring what we have so that we all may eat, so that we all may be heard, so that we may be safe together, and so that we may heal and repair together. Take a look. Amen. And Ashe. Thank you again, Jazzy, for sharing the word of God with us today and reminding us as followers of Christ, we must all be the arms, the feet, the legs of Jesus to live out biblical Christianity each and every day. As we get ready to go, would you please receive this benediction? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority 
before all time, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.